Digital humanities is like a good metaphor. You take some things from two apparently unrelated fields and you yoke them together in a way that brings an entirely new understanding. Throughout history, the most productive discoveries have occurred when researchers cross boundaries and use each other's tools. I started out as a literary scholar in the English department at City University, New York. I had some questions about the nature of creativity. How do you define a radically new unit of meaning? And what are the semiotic mechanisms, if that's what they are, that create new ideas? So I went to the Santa Fe Institute to do research in complex system science and self-organization. At SFI, physicists were using computers to study the emergence of novelty. My research has led me, oddly enough, to investigate reaction diffusion processes that form butterfly wing patterns. I specialize in novelist Vladimir Nabokov's work. He was also a lepidopterist, and he had a theory about how insect mimicry is created. He had recognized how variations on themes spontaneously emerged in his own writing, and he realized that most mimicry in nature was very likely formed not gradually by natural selection, but by self-organization. Mimicry is a concrete example of how new regularities can emerge in nature and become functional or meaningful in some way. I'm currently designing a test for Nabokov's theory of mimicry using a digital simulation. Mathematical biologists have identified some equations that likely govern the process of pattern formation. Frederick Niehaut has created digital simulations of the basic pattern elements here and created some butterfly patterns here. This work gives credence to Nabokov's idea that given the constraints on pattern formation, natural selection would not be necessary to explain how, say, the monarch and viceroy butterflies, which are supposed to be mimics, came to look like each other. The monarch and viceroy butterflies on the top here are from two different genera. On the bottom left is a Cuban king, a relative of the monarch. On the bottom right is a white admiral, a relative of the viceroy. The two patterns may look very different, but there's reason to think that in the bottom two, the dark pigment may simply diffuse longer and farther. The white line may be a later stage of the same reaction process that forms a black line. A substance that acts as an inhibitor of white has diffused away, allowing the white to be expressed. A change like this might happen in a single generation. If we can observe this in a digital simulation, this may indicate that natural selection wouldn't need to work that hard, gradually favoring the reproductively fit in order to create better and better mimics. This has implications in the social sciences as we consider the role that competition might or might not play in evolution. We are accustomed to thinking that natural selection is the only mechanism that imposes order on random mutations, fits organisms to their environments, and gradually creates different forms and species. But before Darwin, there was a very rich and well-developed field of mathematical biology that was investigating self-organizing pattern formation and morphogenesis. Late 18th and early 19th century biologists believe physical forces determine the kinds of natural forms that were possible. For example, these Cartesian maps show how they thought differential forces deform and reshape organisms. Here are some of Nabokov's studies of butterfly wing pattern formation. He was an artist, so he used his powers of observation, but he also dissected and measured. He mapped out the changes and patterns between individuals within a species, and he was able to imagine what sort of changes were possible had been possible, might be possible in the future. When he looked at the case of butterfly mimicry, he understood the underlying physical processes that result in patterns that look alike. So then it becomes necessary to ask, do genes contain the instructions that determine the spatial patterns on butterfly wings? Well, we know that genes make proteins that interact in reaction diffusion processes and eventually self-organize into spatial patterns. From this perspective, it may be more correct to say that the laws of physics and chemistry determine the spatial patterns, not the genes per se. 
It was Alan Turing who discovered the kinds of equations that are used to mimic butterfly wing patterns. Turing was experimenting with morphogenesis in an effort to understand how brains process information using reaction diffusion. He wanted to know how new regularities are created that can carry or encode new information. Like Nabokov, Turing was very interested in the nature of creativity. He knew that, yes, you can design a computer to execute a procedure, but can you design a computer to invent a new procedure? Not long before he died, Turing had started to realize that biological learning was quite different from the machine learning that he had invented, with its reward-punishment process that built up statistical biases. He had been thinking of learning strictly in terms of a selection process, not in terms of self-organization. While trying to understand how homogeneous egg cells could suddenly differentiate, start running their particular genetic programs, he found that statistically insignificant local fluctuations could spontaneously initiate reactions that created a feedback scenario that switched back and forth between reactions, resulting in spatial patterns or temporal patterns. The mechanism involves reactants that can function as self-activators and self-inhibitors. In Turing proposed that reaction diffusion processes lead to the self-organized differentiation of cells, and this affects subsequent triggering of genes and subsequent development. There are all sorts of philosophical implications here. With a little chaos and some feedback, regularity and differentiation can spontaneously emerge. Although it's taken some time for biologists to confirm that the Turing mechanism plays a role in development, and there's been some controversy about it for some time, it's now clear that he was correct. Notably, James Sharp's lab in Barcelona has identified the substances that act as inhibitors and activators in limb bud formation. Reaction diffusion processes are ubiquitous throughout nature, culture, and society. Predator-prey relationships, market supply and demand trends, zebra stripes, seashells. And apropos Turing's initial interest in all this, trying to understand the mechanics of thinking, researchers now argue that brain waves are self-organizing reaction diffusion processes that carry the information of thoughts and memories. I had no idea when I set out to understand how patterns emerge in poetic language that I would end up looking into mathematical biology and these digital models of pattern formation. But what has been really pleasantly surprising is the way that I found my way back to my original question about how new forms and habits of thinking may be created. Crossing intellectual and disciplinary boundaries has been really fruitful. Elijah Meeks, who is a digital humanities specialist at Stanford University Library, joked that digital humanities takes the tools built by warmongers, oil companies, spy agencies, and investment bankers, and uses them to study literature, philosophy, history, culture, and the classics. He's right, digital humanities departments bring together some very different interests, and it's true, I know from when I was at SFI, that a lot of the funding comes from the Department of Defense and financial corporations. They might be more interested in controlling complex systems than appreciating the richness of their behavior. But the fact that your research may have some practical applications won't stop you from pursuing those big questions about what it means to be human.